Hi, my name is David James. I'm Vice President of Engineering here at Patch My PC. Hi, I'm Justin uh, Schelp, and I'm the founder here at Patch My PC. And today we're here to talk about all the good things about a CAS and how to get rid of them if you don't need them anymore. <laughs> so what we're going to start off with, which I think would be pretty fun, is before we actually dive into the video where I walk through the process of removing a CAS, which is pretty typical, like, like the YouTube channel of all the previous videos, we're going to be talking to David, who used to run the entire engineering team for Config Manager, uh, who was around in the development of the CAS, uh, why people needed it, what some of the differences are from Config Man 07 to 2012 and some of the improvements. Uh, so yeah, this will be kind of the intro talking about, you know, what's a CAS and why it makes sense to remove it in a lot of situations. Uh, and yeah, I'll turn it over to you, David, for uh, starting us off. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, it's interesting because um, as, as working on these, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess some of this was a, a long time ago. So, <laughs> you know, I just talk about what is a CAS, why do they exist, and why do so many people need to collapse them? And you know, a lot of times I, I see this happen all the time where things or technology works a certain way and you look at it and you're like, why does it do that? But then when you understand the history of step-by-step of step how it got there, then it kind of makes sense. So in the spirit of, you know, a CAS being so old, I went and got some, some clip art from those days uh, to kind of pay it tribute. So Config Man, 2007. Some of you may have been around and remember this, some maybe not, but the architecture in the hierarchy design for System Center Configuration Manager 2007 was quite different than it is in 2012 and after. Back then you had a central site server, you had primary site servers, and you had even more primaries could be under there. In fact, the depth of primaries then wasn't actually bounded. The, the largest customer I remember had at seven deep kind of primaries chain. Um, why would you do that? Is that is a good question. That's one of the reasons why how CAS worked and how a central site server in 2007 before worked was different. And understand that is is interesting. Um, you know, the way it used to work is computers were assigned to a primary. They pass up their data to that site server, which processed all that data for the clients that reported to it. But then it processed up the un it passed up the unprocessed information to a parent site server, and that site server reprocessed all the information. Um, you actually didn't benefit from that that lower down primary processing. It, it redid all the work, and then that that site server passed it up to a central, which reprocessed all the information again. Um, the pros you could have all kinds of depth in your hierarchies, and they could map. You could use these to map different things like. Uh, business uh, business scopes or big business segregations or geographic segregations but the challenge is, is the same data is processed multiple times so it was super wasteful um, and even worse the central site server it had to scale to handle all clients uh, because it processed all data from all clients no matter what happened below it and for bigger customers the we finally hit a limit a kind of a a moore's law laws of physics scale limit where you just can't buy enough hardware anymore to handle the bigger customers. So the solution was, well, let's partition the data. So instead of having a central manage all clients, let's divide the clients into multiple servers and each of those client partitions will be in charge of everything for that client, processing the data, keeping the results, creating policy, and you know, it actually ends up being that we still call those primary site servers in 2012 and after, but how they deal with data and how they handle the client data is, is interestingly, significantly different. Um, and then the central site server, what used to be the central site server, that went away, and then we had this new thing we called the CCAR to start with, later called the CAS, and it didn't actually process client data at all. All of the processing was happening below. Um, what it was good at was aggregating data and sending kind of change of control commands across multiple partitions. And so that's why the initial name of, of it was the CCAR, we called it Inside in Internal Engineering, which stood for the Central Control and Reporting Server, um, and later renamed to, to CAS. That was, I guess, one good marketing name that we chose, which was simplified things. 
Um, and this actually had a lot of benefits. So one was we got rid of the scale limit of the old central site, and now it's almost limitless scale. Um, in fact, I know the biggest customer, the biggest config man customer in the world, we, Eric, Microsoft tests the hierarchy performance about 40% above that customer, right? That, because with partition, you just get a lot more performance and data is processed much more effectively. It's only processed once. Data, data is very local um, to where it's needed and can be aggregated or, you know, used in views across the, more, the partitions very efficiently. Um, so, you know, that's the, I call it new, even though I guess now we're in 2022, so it's 10 years old, but the, the new model compared to the old model. Now, understanding this is important to understand, like, why do so many people have CAS? Well, a lot of times when, we, when people came from 2007 to 2012, when customers did that, initially when Config Man 2012 shipped, you couldn't add a CAS. You, the day that you installed 2012, you had to decide, do I need a CAS ever or never? And many, many customers coming from the old model 2007 thought, okay, I'm gonna need something that looks like a central site, so I better install one now, just in case I grow into it or in case I need it, because there wasn't an option to add it. So, you know, you talk to customers, you go to conferences and, and you hear, you know, this customer, they have like 5,000 clients and they have a CAS and you're like, well, why do you have a CAS? Well, we at Microsoft kind of forced them to that because we weren't agile to start with, we weren't yeah. flexible. So people had to yeah. predict the future and just in case, you know, they kind of created a cast. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? I even remember as a PFE when we had workshops for setting up Config Man, I think there was like a whole day that was kind of around CAS and installation of a CAS. Um, yeah, because I mean you, you couldn't you couldn't decide after the fact, like you were saying. So, you know, hey, maybe I'll be that size one day. You know, it was, it was a lot different of a decision than Oh, I can always add a primary to a CAS if I ever get to that 100, 150K, right? So, yeah, I remember right. <laughs> I remember us teaching workshops, you know, back at Microsoft. CAS was a big topic for the uh, installation one that I used to run. So, that's funny. Brings back memories. Yeah. Yeah, luckily, luckily we later added the option to expand to a CAS later uh, so that you didn't have, you could start without a CAS. And then decide. Oh, okay, now I need one, and and then add it. But definitely early on, so many people hedged and said, someday I might need it. Maybe we're going to acquire a company and we have to merge them in. And so, so many people early on picked a CAS because, you know, if they ever needed it, they had to do it from day one. Um, and then the other reason is just the way hierarchies worked in 2007 versus 2012 were very different. In 2007, you would have a primary site that was focused on like a branch office or you would do it focused on a business unit or you do it focused on being in a different country and so you design these hierarchies with arbitrary depth kind of based on scope of administration or network locality needs and when we did 2012 we got rid of the reasons that you would do that you know that's things like uh, role-based security or access control were added so that you didn't need to put the hierarchy design in place because of security or or uh, scope of administration. Um, but you know that was a very new way of thinking. So some people when you moved over from 2007 to 12, they still designed their new hierarchy like it was a 2007. Or you know even even then you know this kind of knowledge or new thinking takes time to to spread. So consultants, even in the 2012 days and after, we're still designing new hierarchies with these old principles in mind. Um, and so it's not surprising to me uh, when I hear lots of people have CASs that don't need them. And, you know, me and and so, some of the engineers at Microsoft is partially our fault just because we this change was so drastic and we didn't give some flexible options to start with. Um, so these days, you know, the main reasons to have a CAS is, is you're bigger than 100,000 devices and it actually is probably 100,000 to 150,000, um, you know, or you have unique data sovereignty requirements. There are still some multinational companies that have servers and they can't have the data from one country leave into the other country. So that's a, a corner case that's not very often needed, but sometimes. Um, and then the third option is is the CAS, the way it was designed, actually offloads 
work from the primaries for administration. So the UI or reporting. So there is a even if you're below the device count, but you have a lot of administrators, a lot of people that are in the admin UI and the reporting server, and you want to offload that load. That's one thing that the CAS can do. So you know, I would say you use a CAS if you're above a certain you know, device limit, 100,000, 150,000, or you have like 100 admins that you don't want them in the UI all the time, slowing down collection evaluation or policy, policy creation, for example. But for simplicity's sake, you should probably just collapse your cast unless you, you're one of these corner cases above. Cool. Was that the whole slide? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think we covered all of it. Um, Okay, so next up, when we actually go through and, and the video guide, I'll be showing how to actually collapse a CAS, things you need to think about. Any any other things from your perspective, David, on just the history of CAS or, or anything else before we jump to the actual video guide I did? No, no, I'm just excited to see someone that successfully collapsed a CAS after being asked about it for like 10 years. Yeah, cool. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I think the, I think the overview is going to be super valuable and the history lesson of, you know, why CAS exists, improvements from 07 to 2012, and why in most cases, if you have one, you may not need it anymore. So yeah, thanks so much, David. All right, we're now going to jump into the lab portion of this video where we actually go through the process of removing a CAS that has two child primary sites and converting that to just a standalone primary site. Now, a background of our environment, we are currently logged into the CAS. The site code of that is CAS. The actual site server name is running on a server called Demo1. So that's going to be this uh, this machine right here. It's our current CAS. We then have two standalone primary sites. We have one called DM2. That's running on a site server called uh, Demo2. We then have our second child primary site. The site code is DM3. And for that one, it's running on a server called Demo3. Now, our goal is to get rid of both DM3 site, so that we're going to go ahead and uninstall that. And then after we get down to a uh, single child primary site, we're then going to go ahead and remove the CAS. So our end goal is we're going to be going from a hierarchy that has two child primaries with a CAS at the top, and then we're going to convert that down to a standalone primary site. Now, what I'm going to be walking through in this video is we're actually going to be looking a lot at the Microsoft docs. They have a specific doc called remove the central administration site. So we're gonna be kind of walking through this uh, within this video. There's gonna be what a lot of this is based off of, all the high level things that are important to do based on the docs. Now, the, the first thing I will call out, we cannot actually remove a CAS until it only has a standalone primary site under it um, for that child primary. So since we currently have two, basically step one in a CAS removal is going to be getting down to a single child primary site. So it also links out to another doc that basically covers how do you uninstall a just a primary site, not really specific to a CAS removal, because that's going to be step one. So the big things here, we're going to get rid of our boundaries, and we also need to ensure that all clients are reassigned to another site if applicable. Now, obviously, since we're removing the CAS, we're going to want to make sure those clients currently assigned in most cases, probably most environments that are getting rid of a CAS, they're probably collapsing that, that child primary site for all the child primaries, and they still want those machines to be managed. They likely just want to simplify and go to a standalone primary site. So these are going to be two big things that we're going to look at, make sure that we get our clients reassigned and that we've removed boundaries from the site. So when we uninstall it, there's still not old boundary groups that clients could be trying to assign to or do content lookups based on when that site no longer exists. So jumping back to my console where I'm on the cast, we can see it's a pretty simple environment, but we do have some clients here. So we have some clients that are assigned to DM2. So this is essentially the site that we want to leave. And then we have uh, two clients assigned to DM3. What we want to do is go ahead and bring over the actual client that we want to manage. Uh, we want to reassign that. We don't really care about demo three because that's the site server and this one's ultimately going to go away. So we don't really need to reassign or worry about that. But depending on your environment, if you have a CAS, there's probably a good chance that you may have a large number of clients that you're going to have to migrate over prior to uninstalling that other uh, child primary site. Now in this specific scenario, 
I'm going to just go ahead and reassign just that one one client. Now, depending on your environment and how many you have, you also, you, you know, you just have to use some common sense here and understand that, you know, if you have 50,000 clients you want to reassign, you really wouldn't want to go to a collection or select all the devices and say reassign all of them at the exact same time, right? That wouldn't uh, be good for all the management points to start getting requests in the other site. So just, just plan some stages. Make sure you do this in a way that you don't over load the network and or the uh, different site system roles on the other primary that's going to get uh, these clients assigned to them all at once. So the easiest way that we can actually go through and, and reassign these clients is actually a built-in feature. So I'm going to go ahead and select that client, choose reassign clients, and I'm going to assign it from the current DM3 site that we're going to essentially uninstall. And I'm going to go ahead and move that over to DM2 which is the standalone primary that we're going to make standalone when we remove it from the cast. So I'll go ahead and choose OK on that. And we'll wait a minute while we uh, while this client gets reassigned. All right, so it's been about five minutes. Now, what I did on the client DM3 client that we just reassigned, it looks like the actual trigger might be a policy refresh. So my assumption is that the client reassign feature likely creates policy for the client rather than using the real time BGB channel to do everything at once. And then the next time the client checks in, it seems like that's when the actual reassignment happens. So on the client side, what we did is we, we just logged into DM3 client. So we can see that over here. And what I've done is on the CCM logs folder, I've opened up the location services and the client ID manager startup. So the client ID manager startup is actually going to be when a client is registering with a, a primary site, the log where you can see that happening. So we can actually see the change here directly within this log. It says it's changing from DM3 to DM2. We can then see the registration request get sent to the server. So we can see here the registration being sent and then we should see it get approved and then we can see the client, we can see it's registered here. So it's registering uh, and then it gets approved and then we should start getting policy. So it may not be fully registered yet, but it looks like it's getting there because we can see the assigned management point is now demo two, which is DM3. Although it hasn't fully registered quite yet, we can still see uh, some, some uh, components still looking back at the old one. So it's still going through the process, but we can actually see the site code is now DM2 as well. So it's in the process of, of kind of going through. I'll just do one more machine policy now that we're on the new site and see if we can speed that up. One additional thing that I might do just so we can see this reflect in the console is uh, let's try to do a data discovery cycle, which should uh, send back to the management point of the new DM2 site it's assigned to that it's currently assigned to that site. So we can see it reflect in the console a little bit quicker. Um, but that is basically probably the easiest way if you're already managing clients from a site and you want to kind of move them over to the, uh, the existing child primary that's going to be the standalone, that's going to be the quickest method for you to do that. So I'm going to jump back to the CAS. We'll let this refresh. It likely hasn't reported back quite yet. Uh, it looks like it's actually in the process here. We can see that the site code did actually change. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to go uh, actually on demo three. So we can see we're logged into demo three now. This is the DM3 site that we're essentially going to remove. Now, looking back at the docs for uninstalling a primary, a couple of the big things here, we're going to go ahead and remove some boundaries for this site. We're also going to go ahead and remove all the site system roles that are currently installed on it. Now, at this point, we would assume if we're uninstalling the site system roles, like the management points, uh, things like that, that we've already migrated all the clients like I just did to the site that is ultimately going to manage them in the future. So back over here, I'm going to go ahead and open the console. We can see we're currently connected to the DM3, so we're not actually connected to the top CAS level. So I'm just going to go to this site specifically, go to my servers and site system roles, and I'm going to start removing all of the ones that I know I'm not going to need. This will also help you understand if you have any site system roles that may be running that you need to consider if it's also on the other primary or was it just installed on like this specific child primary that you may need to install on the other one as well. Um, but we've got a pretty basic site, so I'm just going to get rid of things like my distribution point my management point, and my software update point. Outside of that, I think everything else is kind of core site 
uh, uh, site server components. So I would just use the uninstall site once I get here. But now that this process is initiated, I started to click that, we can actually monitor the uninstallation of the site using, or the site component, uh, using the site comp log. So this will show you all the site system roles that are being uninstalled, and it's the site comp service that actually manages that. So for example, I can see the site comp component, it's calling the role setup, and it's specifically removing the SMS management point. So if I were to go back in my logs, I should see an mpsetup.log. And this will actually show the uninstallation of the management point using the verbose MSI logging. So the management point can actually take, uh, it's one of the longer components for site system uh, uh, roles that, that it takes to uninstall. This usually takes about, um, I'd say about six to eight minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video while we wait for this to uninstall. All right, so the uninstall of the management point just completed. What I'm going to do next is just remove some of the boundaries specific to this site. So if I go over uh, boundaries, I can see we do have one. This specific one it was not actually used for site assignment. So if I actually go and look at my demo three site. Oh, let's go back to that boundary group. Let's go to properties. So although it wasn't used for site assignment, that means clients wouldn't actually get assigned to this in the future and fell, uh, it was used for things like my content location for distribution points. So we wouldn't want that hanging around in Active Directory in the system management container after this site is gone. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the boundary group. And then I'm also going to delete all the boundaries for this site that we're going to be removing so that it uh, removes those, those published objects from Active Directory. Now, although it's not really required because I've already removed the management point, so this, the client agent, CCM exec, uh, it's not actually really going to be able to do anything, but just to keep the server clean in case, it, in case it's reutilized, uh, what we could do is we could, uh, we could go ahead and uninstall the actual client agent if it was applicable and you had it on the system. So if I go to C Windows CCM setup, We can just call CCM setup.exe.exe forward slash uninstall. And that will actually remove the client agent if you were actually managing that site server through config man. So we should be able to see the uninstallation process in the CCM logs, CCM setup, and then logs, and then the CCM setup.log. So we should be able to see the actual client uninstalling here as well. So I'll pause this while this completes. It shouldn't take too long for the client. All right, so the client is now uninstalled. So at this point, we've done most of the prerequisites that we need in order to go ahead and uninstall the primary site. So what I'm going to do next is go ahead and open up Add and Remove Programs, just appwiz.cpl, shortcut there. And we're going to actually launch the, let me go ahead and close the console as well. But on demo three, running DM3, so looking back at my CAS, this is going to be the site that we're essentially wanting to remove here. So we've kind of gone through, we've uninstalled all the site system roles. We've already reassigned clients. Let's go back to my devices. I can see that this one now is already reporting back in as active, and we can see it's getting policy from our DM2 site, uh, which is going to be the one that is the standalone primary site once we remove the CAS. So back on DM3, what I'm going to do is go ahead and launch the Configuration Manager uh, site setup. So go ahead and launch that. We're due next here. And we're going to uninstall this site. So go ahead and choose that option. Optionally, just in case something went wrong and you had to add it back, uh, if you wanted to, you could choose the option to... Um, to not remove the database or the console. I feel pretty confident we're in a good place. We've already got a backup as well. So I'm just gonna remove the database from SQL during the setup process and also have it remove the actual console installation as well. We'll go ahead and choose yes on this. And then the log file for the setup, we can either click that, but just because it's gonna be removing some files, I'm just gonna open this uh, directly. So configman setup.log on the root of the installation drive should be where that is. So this will actually be the process that's going to remove the actual main primary site components for the site server. So I'll go ahead and pause it. This might take a couple minutes to complete here. 
Okay, so the uninstallation is now completed from DM3. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Uh, and just to, uh, just so I don't jump back on this, I'm just gonna shut it down and disconnect my RDP window. Now jumping back to my CAS. So we can see that the actual demo three object that used to be a site server still exists under my clients. So I'm just gonna clean that up here and delete that object. Now, if I go back to administration, let's go actually monitoring and look at my site. We can see that it's actually now uh, removed it from the hierarchy. So that uninstallation that we performed seemed to go successful. It's no longer reflecting at the CAS as well. So that all looks good. So if we jump back to the docs, now that we're down to a ch single child primary, we're in a pretty good spot. So if we look back at the plan, we'd wanna see like what's next in this process. So the big thing is try to understand like what site system roles are currently running on the CAS that you may need to account for when you move to a standalone primary. So for example, if you're using cloud management gateway, you would need to re remove that CMG role and reconfigure it on the primary site uh, once you uninstall the CAS. A couple, uh, a couple other ones, reporting services point. So this is actually one that we have configured at the CAS uh, in this environment, and we'll go through that specific process. We're not gonna go through CMG today. We do have a separate video that covers how to install Cloud Management Gateway. Uh, but I'm currently on my CAS, so let's go back to my site system roles. We can see this one is currently running the reporting services point, which would make sense because it's the CAS, and this would have been where you would have got all your reports for all the child primaries. But now that we're just about ready to remove this, let me go ahead and remove that reporting services point. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump back over, actually I think this is the first time that we're logging into DM2 site on demo two. Uh, what we're gonna do is actually go install the reporting services point over here. Because I didn't actually add that configured on DM2. If we look at site system roles, I can see that the reporting services point wasn't actually there. Now we will need to ensure that's there once we get down to a standalone primary. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to run any of the built-in SSRS reports that are available. So what I've done to save time, I've already downloaded the reporting services reporting um, point or reporting services 2019 installer. So I'm just going to go ahead and launch that. Now, uh, looks like uh, looks like we may already have it. Let me just take a quick look to see if I can find that. So report server configuration manager, it looks like is the name. So it's basically a next, next, next installation. Let me just see if I can connect here. So I haven't really done anything post installation, just went through the basic steps of installing the reporting services installer, just did next, next, next. Now, once we actually install it, there is some manual configuration that we need to perform before we can actually install the reporting services point. So if I actually open SQL Management Studio, I can see I don't have any reporting services databases. I just have my Configman database and WSUS database. So what I'm gonna do is click on web service URL and go ahead and choose apply so that it binds and creates the web service URL that I can use for my reporting services point within Configman. Uh, next up, once that's done getting created, we're gonna create the database. Jump over here to the database. We can see we don't currently have any reporting services database. So I'm gonna go ahead and click change and we're gonna create a new one. We're gonna install it on our existing SQL server on the site server. We'll leave just the default name here and then do next here. Okay, that looks good. If I go refresh SQL Management Studio, I should see those new databases here. Uh, one thing I will do is set the recovery method to simple. That will just keep the log file from getting crazy and tracking all my changes. Um, otherwise, your report server database might get rather large uh, and you really won't know why. So changing it from full to simple will keep the database cleaner and you don't really need a full even to recover it for a config man reporting point at least. So we can see the tempdb is already simple. So we should be good here. And then the last setting is we're gonna create the uh, web portal URL. And this would be the URL that would actually be accessible to run your reports. Okay, that looks good. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and now add my reporting services point role. So I'm just gonna go through next. Reporting services point. 
And as long as our configuration was successful, we should have the reporting services instance that was created. In this case, uh, looks like I don't have any service account that I have within ConfigMan today. So let me just go ahead and copy one that I'm gonna add. Okay, new account. And what's gonna happen here, this is gonna just, ConfigMan will automatically give this account the rights to uh, SQL reporting services so it can upload the reports through the service. Um, so that should be good. It, uh, hopefully you already have some service accounts configured. If not, you can just create an account specific that will only have the rights here if you wanted to. And then we'll do next here. Now, if we go back into my site server logs here in DM2, the same site comp log should kick in, and that's going to be the component that kicks off the installation of the reports. There we go. We can see it installing the SMS SRP, so that's the SQL Server Reporting Services point role. So we should now, if we go back to our logs, have an SR SRP MSI.log. This is the verbose logging of the actual uh, MSI that's installing the, the binaries that run that role. And then we also have the more basic log, SSRSP uh, setup.log. This will just show the core installation here that is calling the MSI. Now, the one that's actually kind of interesting, the one that copies the reports after installation, that's going to be the SR uh, SRP setup or SR, let's see if I can read that. SRSRP.log. This is actually going to be what connects to the reporting instance on the back end and actually uploads the RDLs and the reports to the actual reporting services point through IAS. So I'll pause it for a minute. It can take a couple minutes for this process to kick in, but we'll come back once we actually see the reports getting uploaded. Okay, so we can see the reports currently uploading now. So if we go into my console on this uh, DM2 child primary site and look under my reports. We should hopefully start to see some folders getting populated here as well as some reports uh, within here. So let's just do a quick run and just see if that will work for us. Yep, so it looks like that report loaded just fine. So it's currently in the process of deploying that. If we go back to my CAS, I can see that uh, the reporting point is now uninstalled and fully gone. Now there's some other potential site system roles that might be applicable to you. So for example, if you're using endpoint protection, asset intelligence, you would wanna go ahead and start the uninstallation of those roles. In my specific environment, we didn't have those. Um, so most of those are pretty simple, next, next, next. So you would just wanna remove them from the CAS and make sure that they exist on the standalone primary if you actively use those features. Now, the only other things that I'll call out that you wouldn't want to remove because ConfigMan will automatically handle it when we uninstall the CAS is the service connection point and the software update point. So these are two site system roles that we would leave on the CAS because they actually connect down. So for example, the software update point that exists on the CAS, the way that it currently would work if you're in a CAS environment is um, the WSUS server over here on the CAS would connect up to Microsoft updates, and then it would then replicate down to the child primary. So uh, what's gonna happen is once we uninstall the, the software update point over here, we'll be able to, uh, in that installation, what it's essentially gonna do is say, hey, DM2, this software update point, now should be the software update point that synchronizes uh, directly with Microsoft. So it's gonna basically get rid of this and then it's gonna reconfigure this software update point to go right to Microsoft and it's gonna already have all the software update points that were previously replicating down from the CAS. So it's a pretty simple uh, process where you don't have to uninstall the software update point and resync the entire catalog. Uh, it will actually do that all for you and reassign and have the uh, child primary become the WSS server that syncs directly with Microsoft rather than the software update point running on the CAS. All right, so at this point, I think we're at a pretty good place where we can look at the prerequisites to actually uninstall the CAS. So we can validate, you know, we're on the latest current branch build, so we're well above that, that should be fine. We have administrator rights, we're logged in as an admin on ConfigMan. We're also a local admin of the server. Um, so everything from this whole list is currently kind of ready to go. Um, 
So what we're going to go ahead and do on the CAS is we're going to open up Atom Remove Programs, run our Config Manager site maintenance or uh, site setup. Let me go ahead and remove or close my console so there's no conflicts. We're going to do next here. We're going to perform site maintenance or reset will actually be what we do here. We're then going to choose the option to delete a central administration site. So there's going to be the process to get rid of it. And then we're only going to be left with our primary site DM2. So go ahead and choose that option. We'll do next. Now, this is going to be where we want to install the new service connection point. So I guess I can't copy from there. We're going to go ahead and install it directly on our site server. So demo2.contoso.local. So that's going to be the new uh, service connection point that's going to synchronize and get all the latest config man updates. So we'll do next on that. Let's see if it can connect. Okay, so it looked like it connected fine. That took a, maybe about 30 seconds while I paused the video. Uh, so let's go ahead and close this out. Go back to kind of like just this window open. So it ran the prereqs. Everything does look good. So let's go ahead and click on begin setup. So that should start the uninstallation. Let me go ahead and open the log file up. We can see at this point, it's just doing a lot of SQL in store inserts and stored procedures, likely deleting all the info from the CAS from that child primaries database for DM2. So we'll see that process taking place. If we look back at the docs, it also says there may be some information happening on the hman.log, the hierarchy manager. Oh, wrong one. That's the archive one. Let's open that up. Okay, so we can see the hman.log is stopped on the, uh, on the CAS. Now let's open back the setup and likely uh, what the what the docs actually said was we're going to go look at hman.log on what's going to be the new standalone primary, which would be DM2. So let's open up the hman.log over here and we'll just kind of monitor this as things are happening. So let me jump back to the CAS now uh, and we'll just wait for this to complete and we'll come back and kind of see what we're left with here. All right, the uninstallation is now complete. We can see that everything went well. The only issue that we had is it couldn't remove the objects from Active Directory for the CAS object within the system management container. So that's likely just the permissions where the computer account of the CAS, I didn't properly delegate the permissions to actually edit existing objects. So to quickly fix this, I can just log into my domain controller. You could also log into any machine that had the RSAT tools for Active Directory. Uh, as long as you have the rights to edit. So within the container system management active directory, I'm going to go ahead and find any object with CAS in it. So we'll go ahead and choose CAS and choose delete. And then let's also let's see. There we go. I can also see the DM3 object didn't get removed either for the site. So since we've already uninstalled that, uh, I'll go ahead and clean that one up as well and we should be good at this point. We wouldn't have anything left over within the system management container for this uh, CAS collapse. Okay, so I can go ahead and close, and then we can close. So I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect from the CAS. We're pretty much uninstalled and done at this point, uh, with the exception, actually, let me keep it connected. There may be a few additional configurations post-installation for the CAS. Now, if I go back into my DM2 site, we can see that quite a few different things happen in the hman.log, like the doc said, everything looks good there. Let's just refresh my console and click administration. We can see the DM1, the demo1 site, doesn't even show up here under service site and site system roles. If I look at my site hierarchy, I can see it's now uh, just a standalone primary. So we can see the uninstallation of the CAS uh, went well and everything is now fully removed and we're sitting with a standalone primary site. If I go look at my devices, I can confirm everything looks uh, good here as well. Now we're not quite done yet. We do have some post installation tasks that we need to perform. So if I look back at the docs, a couple things for some best practices. So let's go ahead and remove the computer account from having administrative rights. So the old site uh, server account, they no longer have to have administrative administrator rights on our 
uh, machine anymore. So demo one, that was the CAS. And then we have demo three, which used to be the, the other site server for the other uh, child primary. So they no longer need to have rights to administrator on this new server. So we'll go ahead and remove them just in case something ever happened and someone had access to that computer account. They couldn't connect into the standalone primary anymore. We do also want to update our boot images for OSD to have the new trusted site uh, certificate. It's no longer going to be the CAS. It's now going to be this, this site is going to generate and it would have a new certificate to update. So under software library, operating systems, boot images, we would want to go to all the boot images that are applicable to you and just choose to update boot images and then next. So this process will take a couple minutes, but you would want to do this for all the boot images within your environment that are actively used. So once I'm done with the 64-bit boot image, I'm going to go ahead and do the same process for the 32-bit in the background, and we'll come back once that's complete. All right, so both boot images are now up to date. Uh, going through the list again, yeah, if you had things like uh, Azure Monitor or other configurations, there's a few other steps that you have, but that's not applicable for me. Now, if you were using Surface drivers, that feature will have to be checked in your new software update point on the uh, standalone primary. So if you didn't, in fact, have that checked on the CAS, what you would basically want to do is go to the software update point um, for this new machine, and then you would want to enable the Surface drivers under classifications, uh, and then you could just check this box. Now, this will sync quite a bit more from the Windows Update catalog, so I would only use this if you're actually actively updating Surface drivers through the WSUS catalog and software update point. Now, this next one is uh, likely a big one that will probably affect quite a few people if they're doing a CAS collapse. And there are some unique situations if you are using third-party software updates. So uh, what's interesting is we actually worked with the product group for some issues that we saw with a CAS collapse and more specifically when a software update point is kind of relocated as well. Um, what essentially happened in, in this situation is, let's just go back to our hierarchy and see if I can kind of draw up what, what actually is kind of happening here. So what we, what we used to have, let's just go ahead and draw in. So we used to have our CAS. So we had CAS, and then we used to have our child primary site. So let's go Control, and then I'll just call this uh, DM2. So the way that third-party updates would work, as well as just the software update point in general, is the top-level uh, software update point would be the one that synchronizes for uh, Windows Update. So we'd have the Windows Update catalog over here. We'll just call it uh, WU slash Microsoft Update Catalog. And when you actually publish third-party updates, it would be published from the topmost software update point. So what essentially it would happen is you would have to have a WSUS signing certificate unique to you. And then it would actually publish the binaries and all the, all the data into the main software update point living on the topmost sub. So we'd have a sub over here. And then, you know, we would have our child software update point that's actually running down here on the child primary. Now, what happens is when we actually publish, whether it's patch my PC, just because that's, that's exactly what we do as a company, we do third party updates or whether it's driver catalogs that are free out there that you're subscribed to on the console, or even if it's any other vendor that provides uh, updates that get published to WSUS as a third-party update, this would, uh, this would be applicable to all of those different situations. So what happens is uh, the method would be used to publish to kind of that top sub over here, and that's where the full content would go for the actual binaries that are code signed using your certificate. Now, what happens is when that uh, replicates to the child primaries, it's only a subset of the metadata. So it doesn't include things like the binaries um, and, and things like that. So what happens is when we remove that top level sub and when you actually reconfigure updates, whether it's drivers through the catalog or whether it's uh, Patch My PC or any other vendors, there, when it goes and checks whether an update's been published, it's only a subset of the metadata and it doesn't actually include the binary with your unique code signing certificate for third-party updates. So what would happen is it would actually re republish that update using 
the new uh, certificate, whether you export it, and we'll actually go through that process. But it would essentially publish it as a, as a new update, but it would use the same unique ID, but it would be a new update with the perspective. It would re-sign the update because it doesn't think the content is there. So what happens in this specific situation is um, clients actually can have issues because uh, either the certificate could have changed or they're going to get a hash validation error because it was re-signed again using the certificate because it didn't have the same content to detect that. So your clients will essentially get some hash issues uh, in this situation. But we're going to walk through kind of the, the ways that you can resolve this. And if we scroll a little bit up, there's a bit more details that kind of describe the situation I was just talking about. So one of the, the things to consider, and I'll show you a better way to do this if you're using Patch My PC. We specifically built the feature when we we're working with a product team on this issue to help account for this and have a, a better resolution than coming across the hash issues. Um, so this is basically the point that talks a bit more about this, but basically in the prerequisites, they say, hey, if you're using third-party updates, try to get all of them deployed and installed prior to collapsing the CAS so that you don't have to worry about your clients getting hash errors. Now, that's not a great solution because you still may have clients that come on after the fact that are trying to install updates that have been published previously. Um, so to walk you through how you could resolve this specifically with Patch My PC, I'll show you a feature that we have. Now, if you're using a third, a different third party or the built-in drivers, um, what you would want to do is kind of read through this guide and you could use this method to try to get them re-signed and deleted and things like that. So uh, stepping back to kind of the process, a um, few things that we have here. We need to reconfigure our WSUS signing certificate if, if we can. Uh, we then need to, you know, republish and configure our third party updates uh, from here as well. So to show you what I'm going to do specific for Patch My PC, I'm going to go back to my CAS. We're going to open up the Patch My PC Publisher. This is the automated tool that we specifically use for our product. If you're using another vendor or the the, the, the built-in console, um, that could you you could just re reconfigure that on the new DM2 standalone primary site. Specifically for our product, what I can do is go to Advanced. So this is from the old CAS that isn't going to be publishing or really working anymore. And I'm just going to export our settings.xml within the uh, within my desktop and save it there. Okay. Now, a uh, couple things we have here. We do have in any third-party updates, whether it's uh, Patch My PC or whether it's a, a different vendor or the built-in console, there is a WSUS signing certificate that you would have configured uh, when you set up uh, the, the updates. Now, if you created a certificate using our publisher, one thing that we do allow you to do is export the private key by default. So, for example, if I click Generate, um, I'll choose yes, but I won't actually overwrite it. We do have this option where by default, we allow you to export the private key. This is specifically helpful in scenarios like this, where you're moving from one WSUS server to another, and you don't have to regenerate a WSUS signing certificate, or really it's just a code signing cert. Um, you can export it and import the same one. So the benefit here is that you don't have to redeploy the WSUS signing certificate to your clients. We could just reuse the existing one. Now, if you did just generate a new one on your, your new standalone primary, that's not a big deal as well. You could just simply deploy the certificate using whatever method you did before. But since we actually enable this feature, I'm just going to use the existing one just to keep it simple. So I'm going to go to certificates. And within the computer store, there should be a WSUS folder. And then here's the actual certificate from the CAS that we are using for third-party updates. So I'm going to go ahead and export that. And this is the big, the big part here. Um, so if you didn't use our product, it still may be possible that you could, could export the key just depending on the product you use. I do know if you let Config Manager generate it, they do not allow the private key to be exported just as a security precaution so that someone with admin rights couldn't go export that key and use it elsewhere. Um, so just be aware if you don't have this option, you will have to recreate your WSUS signing certificate on your new standalone primary. But in my case, I'm just going to export and reuse. We'll have to give it a password and we're going to use that when we import it onto the new server. So we'll go desktop, 
and I'll just call it WSUS cert and save it on my desktop here. And then okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy both of these from demo one, which was my CAS, and I'm just gonna copy those over to the desktop on demo two, which is my new standalone primary site. Now what I'm gonna do is go to specific for our product. So I'll just do docs.patchmypc.com. I know we've got about 3,600 customers, so there might be a good chance, you know, if you are CAS collapsing, maybe use our product. So this might be applicable. If not, a lot of the same concepts will still apply with regards to the certificate. So I'm just gonna go ahead and download the installer. And we'll just get that reconfigured over here real quick. Now, if I go ahead and run that. Now, if I go ahead and open my actual console, we should still see that any third-party updates that were published, there still exist. Um, the only issue is once you've reconfigured the product to start publishing again, that's where the specific scenario will happen where you had the, um, the issue with the hash uh, certificate because it would get re-signed using the new certificate. Okay. All right, so we're now in the publisher, brand new installation, and I'm just gonna import that existing WSUS signing certificate that's on my desktop. So this is the one that we imported with, or exported from the CAS, and now we're just gonna reuse that on this site. Now, since I also use my uh, export option, anything that you had enabled within the updates tab would still be fully configured here as well. So for example, I think I had Chrome, let's take a look. Uh, actually, I haven't imported yet. I just imported the certificate. So if I go to the advanced tab, we can import from a backup. And I can just choose that settings.xml that I exported. So now we're saved. Now if we go back and look at Chrome, we can see Chrome is enabled. We also have all the same right-click options. So for example, let me also go to Notepad. This is one where I had the uh, various different options here enabled. So you can see the desktop shortcuts. If you had things like the manage conflicting processes where you can notify the user that you know something uh, needs to be closed that should all carry over all the same configurations both for the configman software updates as well as the application creation feature so you really shouldn't have to reconfigure anything here now the specific scenario that i was talking about that i that i said where we we essentially have a solution for the hash issue that would occur if we were to just run a sync what we actually can do to fix this is we're going to right click on all updates and we have this feature called republish during the next sync. So what the republish specifically does is it will detect that there's already an update published into WSUS and it will decline that update and remove it by default. So if I click yes, it's going to decline and remove the existing update. It's then going to automatically publish a brand new update with a new GUID ID that we generate, so it's totally different than the separate one. And what that essentially does for us, if I run my synchronization, we'll see this publishing in the background. The reason this specifically helps to resolve is because, let's go to here, it will actually create a brand new update. So clients that had already downloaded the update content, they wouldn't try to reinstall it because it's gonna get declined and expired they would simply install the new one that's completely new that they wouldn't have the cached hash for via policy. And that would be how this would work around it. Now within our log, here's where we can actually see that there's a subset of the data that isn't in the WSUS database. And that's because this used to be a child primary that didn't sync the entire schema. So what we're gonna do is click options. We're gonna open the configman wizard or the modify updates wizard for WSUS. And let's go ahead and see if we can decline. So we'll go ahead and uh, select them with the space bar and choose decline. So now we went ahead and declined it. So let's go close this wizard. Okay, so let's just go look at Chrome once more. We'll make sure that the republish is still enabled and let's try to run one more synchronization here. So there we go, we can see that we're, uh, since the update was already declined, we can see it was just kind of ignored when it had originally tried to decline it. But what we can see in the log file is that the update is declined and we detected it needs to re 
update that specific update and republish as a brand new update. So we'll be able to see that it's it's basically publishing an entirely new update to WSUS, which will then sync into ConfigMan. So if we go ahead and open up Configuration Manager, uh, the console, and we look at the existing version of Google Chrome, what we'll see, let me just add the unique ID column for that update. We'll see the existing Google Chrome update ends in E4. Now, if we look at the actual log that's being republished, let's go look. So we can see that we're going to publish an entirely new update that is set to supersede that previous update. So what's going to happen once this uh, publishing is complete, we'll open up the wsyncmanager.log and we'll actually be able to see, open that up, we'll be able to see the new update that comes in. So, oh, wrong log, WSync Manager. So here we go. We can see that the update just completed, our publishing for Patch My PC, and we then triggered a software update point for Configuration Manager. So we'll be able to see that synchronization take place, and I'll pause it while that, while that finishes. Okay, the resync or the republishing of updates is now completed, and we can see it synchronized into Config Manager. Now let me just refresh here. So we can see that that previous one is now expired or superseded, which became expired, and we can see the new one that was republished. Now, one thing that I forgot to do, which will make this much cleaner, is in the options of the updates, there is this option where we can choose not to append the republished date to the update. So if you just didn't want to have this, this republished to, uh, to the screen, Let's go back here. If you didn't want to have this kind of appended to the republished version, you'd probably want to check that box before you go through and publish the updates. Um, but outside of that, that's kind of how we can work around this specific issue uh, within the hash where you collapse the CAS and it has to re-sign the update rather than having it re-sign the existing update. Uh, what we'll essentially do is supersede and decline the previous update and publish a brand new update with a new GUID on the fly. Now that's pretty much the entire kind of uh, post uh, collapse steps that are documented. Now a few other things that you might want to check, for example, for me I know I used to have boundaries configured. So if I go look at my boundaries, uh, let's go over here, I can see that I don't have all the boundaries that I need now that I collapse the old site. I think I may have actually deleted these uh, on accident as well. But let's say for example you had some boundaries that used to be specific to the DM3 site. Uh, what you would want to do, oh, DM2, you'd want to make sure that all those new boundaries are configured uh, that will point to the new DM2 site systems, right? So I'm going to just have an IP range. Now, the way that I used to have this configured is I had my um, DM3 site was like anything that was from 192.168.1.20 to like 22 because I only had two machines that were going to DM3. And then my DM2 site was 192.168.1.18 and 19 for that range. But now that I have all machines kind of on this subnet, I can have them all go to the same site now, right? So depending on, you, you could use an IP range, site, IP subnet. There's a variety, uh, variety of different ways we could do this. But we would just want to make sure that clients that used to be in a boundary group that was pointing to the site that you've basically collapsed are now part of a boundary group that is applicable for the new site systems like your distribution points, uh, software update points, things like that in the new site that you've collapsed to as your standalone primary. So what I basically did is I ensured that all the boundaries I used to have, like this, this new one I created, would have encapsulated all the specific ones for DM3, right? So we'll go ahead and do apply. Uh, and that would be another thing that you'd wanna ensure that you check when you go and do that migration. All right, but outside of that, that concludes the entire video. Hopefully this was valuable and thank you for watching.